Hi and welcome back to the Cat Tutor. Today we will be looking at Cat Grade Tens, Chapter Six, Hardware. In this section, we will be looking at input devices, output devices, multifunctional devices, storage media devices, and processing devices. Input pointing devices. Pointing devices are used to move the cursor on your screen. I'm sure by now you have noticed, if you have a personal computer or a laptop, that there is a little white arrow on your screen that moves around as you move your, probably, uh, probably a mouse or a, if you have a laptop, your touchpad. These are all pointing devices. They do nothing more and nothing less than move that little white arrow on your screen. Aside from the popular mouse, that most people use. There are quite a few devices actually that fall under this category. Examples of them are touchpads, trackballs, touch screens, stylus or pens, joysticks, game controllers and pointing sticks. Touchpads will be found on most notebooks and laptops. If you find one that does not have one on, congratulations. <laughs> But they should by all means be built in with this, which is an advantage in its own because you do not have to buy any external mouse, although most people prefer doing it in any way because it's just that much more convenient. Pointer sticks refer to a small nub or a joystick on the computer keyboard itself. You won't find a great many keyboards with this on, but if you find a red button somewhere above one of your keys, don't, don't, don't jump out of your skull. Don't worry, it's supposed to be there. That would be a pointer stick, similar to a joystick, which you just move up and down, left and right. This works with only your finger to move the cursor on your screen. Track balls, on the other hand, sometimes referred to as an upside down mouse is a literal ball that's it can be stuck to what looks like a mouse or it can be on its own depending on what device you find it on this device is a little ball that has sensors that is exposed to any movement of this ball if you move your while touching this ball if you move your hand up then the cursor on your screen will go up if you move it to the left or right same goes a lot of people refer to it as an upside down mouse because this is how mouses worked originally. Or mice for all the picky people. By moving your palm or finger across the ball at the bottom, the cursor would move in the opposite direction. Well, it's the same concept except it moves in the same direction. Touch screens. Now, be careful when mentioning this as an input device. Yes, touch screens are input devices, but they are also output devices. Why? Because at the end of the day, it is a screen, it is showing you a picture of what's happening, therefore it is an output device as well. Okay, but touch screens have many added features to them that a touch pad does not have. For example, sometimes touch pads, you can, what we would call pinch it to make the screen go bigger or smaller. But in touch screens, on the other hand, this is almost always a given. You are able to move around, click on things, just like with a touch pad, but you can also minimize and maximize your screens by pinching or expanding two fingers at the same time on the screen. Then it works. This is ideal for restaurants and other fast food areas where they need to work quickly. They can't sit in front of a computer and type out 50 different things at a time, the whole time, every day. They have to do input much quicker in these places. After all, it is a fast food or a restaurant. They can't sit around in front of computers instead of helping people. Okay, so this is ideal for areas like that, which you need to input stuff quickly, accurately, finish, ta-da. Pen input, for those who have never seen stylus or anything remotely like it, 
is exactly what it says. The device looks similar to a pen and is used in the same way to interact with the computer. It can be used along with text recognition software for text input or it can be used for more creative purposes. Many designers use this to draw with because it is much easier and more efficient than trying to use a mouse to draw with. Anyone who has tried this will understand why. Joysticks. Another input device is definitely a joystick. It can be used for controlling the movement of the cursor and pointer on your computer, but it is more commonly used for gaming. It can be used in car games mostly. Some people, brave enough to tackle the challenge, can even use joysticks in shooter games or other first-person games. But most of the time it is used in car, well, <laughs> yeah, car games basically. Now, the other device, similar and sometimes also referred to as a joystick, would be a game controller. Note the name game controller this is usually used in games rarely used for anything else the one advantage of a joystick though is that it is a little bit easier to use in certain circumstances in certain areas especially in some games but other than that not really that fantastic input scanning and reading devices flatbed scanners exactly as the name would suggest it is flat it sits still it is ideal for images and stuff that you don't really want to damage or move around too much like old pictures of your aunt or great 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 uncle somewhere along the line who outstandingly has a photo this would be ideal for fragile materials that you want to photocopy or scan. Handheld scanners, exactly as the name suggests, is a scanner that is held by hand. It works on the same principle as a flatbed scanner and is ideal for documents and photographs that can't be moved at all or placed in a flatbed scanner. It scans the document to a digital form, same as a flatbed scanner, where it can then be manipulated or edited from there if you had the necessary software known as optical character recognition. It can also be transferred and emailed digitally. Sheet feed scanners. These scanners is a digital imaging system that was designed for scanning loose sheets of paper. Not your broken grandma's photos that are extremely fragile and precious to you, no. The flatbed scanners are ideal for those, but if you have large amounts of paper and documents that needs to be scanned in, the sheet feed scanner is the way to go. You can place a stack of papers on top of the scanner and it will feed each paper one by one through whilst scanning the content. These scanners can also be known as ADF scanners or automatic document scanners. Radio frequency identification. Somewhere along the lines in your life, you would have come across this by now, be it in a shopping mall or in a resort. RFID has become quite the popular scanning and reading device. RFID is a wireless non-contact use of radio frequency waves to transfer data from the tag to the system. In other words, if you have this tag stuck to something, then if it goes past its scanners, not necessarily touching it, but close enough, if it when it goes past its scanner, it will send out its signal saying, mm -mm, nope, 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 somebody is trying to take me without permission, or it will simply give information about what am I, who am I, why am I, and what my price is. Anything can be added to this RFID information. This is why it is also useful in areas such as resorts for tags on wristbands. Magnetic strip. This refers to a strip of magnetic material, hence the name, 
that is normally placed on the back of cards like debit cards, credit cards, company loyalty cards, smart shopper cards, all of these cards such as disc game cards, clicks cards and so forth. On these strips there's information with regards to who owns this card, how much is on this card, what is the information about this card. It's stored via electromagnetic process for automatic reading, decoding or recognition by the device that detects the magnetic variation on the strip. In other words, a bunch of stuff stored on this magno strip and it is read by a scanner. This also helps preventing counterfeiting or faking these cards. Let's face it, it's easy to make a card, not as easy to make it real. Magnetic ink character recognition. Many of you have seen slips that has been printed out with the most horrible font you've probably ever seen in your life. This would probably be the magnetic ink character recognition font. This technology is used to verify the legitimacy or originality of paper documents such as checks or special document papers. In other words, it's there to make sure that this thing is definitely real, definitely not copied by you who accidentally forgot to do certain things like pay your bills and now you're trying to escape. Okay, whatever reason it may be, this is there to make sure that whatever the document is, it is legitimate. It is printed with special ink, special font, special everything, hence the magnetic ink used. The scanners that scan this require this ink to be magnetic. How else is it going to pick it up? Have you ever wondered what those numbers at the bottom of a check was when it's printed out with this special ink which has uh, specific magnetic properties? Information can be encoded in the magnetic characters which then read by the MICR reader will determine whether it is authentic or counterfeit real or fake. Optical mark recognition. Optical mark recognition which you must never confuse with optical character recognition. Optical mark recognition scans a printed form where it then reads predefined positions. In other words, have you ever written a test on a multi-choice piece of paper and they told you do this or do that but don't do this don't do this mark here not there mark like this not like that well there is actually a good reason for this as the example that is next to all of the lovely text on this slide will show all of those blocks all of those circles all of those spots were almost designed to be in that exact position because this is what the scanner searches for. It goes to that exact little spot, sees, okay, is something there? Is it like this dark or this light? And then it'll pick up, okay, you, you had this one right, okay, you had this one wrong, sorry for you, tough luck, better luck next time. This is what it does. It searches for those predefined little spots and then it picks up whether or not something has been marked there or not. This technology is usually used by universities to mark multiple choice option question papers. Barcoding. With this method data is being presented by varying the width and space of parallel lines that is grouped together. Long story short, all those little lines sometimes they're different thickness, sometimes they're different length, sometimes they're different widths apart. All of that determines the uniqueness of this barcode and what information can be stored onto it or what information can be recorded from it. It is read via a barcode scanner that then interprets the information so that you can get it. It is most commonly used to give information on products that is sold in shops as I'm sure you have seen before in your life. If you have not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for you. Information contained is normally the name of the product as well as the price. 
optical character recognition. Now this one, this one is very important. Whenever you're scanning in a document, simply scanning in the document won't do much. Yes, if it's a picture, it'll have basically done its job. But if you wanted to scan in a document so that you could change what is on it, then I'm afraid if you do not have this software, you're not going to have much luck. Optical character recognition software. A bunch of people came, sat together, wrote in their most loveliest, horriblest, most eccentric handwriting, and then told this computer, this is what to look for, then that means that this is what is standing there. And this is the principle that was used to start building optical character recognition. It reads your writing or normal typed writing and it searches for the closest possible match, which character it is, and then that's what it puts there. This way you can determine what is on either a handwritten document or a normal type document. It can then scan this whole document in to make an electronic version which you can then edit, delete, scratch, put a picture in, move data around or email to someone else. Getting to image and video input. Digital cameras. I'm sure you've all heard about them. I'm sure some of you have even owned one. This is a hardware device that can be used to take photos or videos and all of the information that it gains is stored on a special memory card inside the camera. This memory card can be removed, placed in your computer if you have the necessary socket or it can be placed in a memory card reader that has an adapter connected to it. There are many ways of skinning a cat in this case. But one thing to remember is unlike analog cameras which expose the chemicals on film to light, a digital camera uses digital optical components to register the intensity and color of light and then convert it into pixel data. All of this pixel data is then compiled into a single image and voila, you have your picture. Video cameras, on the other hand, these cameras are used for capturing motion pictures electronically. It must be clearly stated, however, that it is quite different from a movie camera that captures it to film. Just as digital cameras had their analog versions, so did video cameras. They also had their film versions. Webcams. For those of you who do not know this, I'm so sorry. But webcams are video cameras, mini little video cameras that can either be bought separately or sometimes even built into your devices. Most laptops, well, yeah, about most of them, have a built-in webcam that can record them. If you have not found this, look at your screen very carefully. Look at the top of your screen. I added, I am talking to the people that have laptops. If you see a little circle there with a tiny little circle inside of it, then that's probably a webcam just looking at you. Anyway, it is a webcam. Websites. Bum, bum, bum. Gamers usually use this when they are busy streaming or doing live feeds on videos in real time of their videos. Uh, while they are busy playing whatever they are playing, I would not question what it is they are playing, but it can also be used for, pe for non-gamers, people in companies, uh, people using programs like Skype. Now, webcams do not necessarily need to be used for this. They can be used for more personal reasons, like having a little video diary. It is basically just a mini little camera built into your computer or that you can buy separately. Input sound. Microphones is the most common sound input. If you found another one, congratulations. Microphones are devices that capture audio. 
It does so by converting sound waves into electrical signal. This signal can then be sent or amplified as an analog signal or converted to digital signal where it can be processed by a computer or other digital audio devices. Mostly it is used by gamers. Once again, we gamers. Mostly it is used by gamers when they do multiplayer gaming or also by teachers and lecturers that record lessons for students. However, one thing that should be noted is that when giving commands to smartphones or doing searches with smart devices like well, a smartphone or Alexa or all of those, in order for any device to be able to understand what you are saying or to be able to decode the command you have given to them, they do require voice recognition software. Voice recognition software requires a microphone. If you do not have both of these, you cannot, well, tell your device what to do. It's just not going to work. Voice recognition software is required to decode any command given through sound input. This program has to actually be trained to recognize the user's voice. Keep in mind, we all sound different. All of our accents are not necessarily the same. If you installed an, let's say, an American voice recognition system in Scotland, do you really think it would work? I mean, come on, people, you have to catch up, seriously. Voice recognition needs to actually be trained to recognize you. If you have a new phone, for example, that you want to give commands to, or if you have a smart system built into your house, so that if you say lights, the lights will go on or off, or TV, then the TV will go on or off, then you actually have to train your device for easily up to 10 days or two weeks or three weeks even, if you're lucky, only a few days. You actually have to train your device to be able to understand what you are saying. Microphones are a must. If you don't have one, sorry, how else is it going to hear you? Coming to biometric input, on the other hand, fingerprint scanners, being one of them, are a popular security barrier which can be found in all types of high-end devices that are currently available on the market. Mostly they're found in security complexes or even in your cell phone. How do you think you can unlock it with your finger? The technology is fast and quite simple to use, but, and here's the big one, there are quite a few disadvantages and advantages to using it. Fingerprint scanners are highly secure. As you would know, all fingerprints are unique. There's no risk of forgetting your password. They are easy, cheap and fast to set up. Faster than typing out passwords and pins. Fingerprint scanners are quite accurate, trust me. It is ideal for PC user authentication. In other words, if you want to make sure nobody can log into your PC just by figuring out your password, you can rather lock your PC system with a fingerprint scanner than only you could access it. There are many more advantages about and the use of fingerprint scanners over other types of security measures. But if I had to name them all, this video would be longer than it needed to be. Now, disadvantages on the other hand. Hackers can find fingerprints on surfaces. Well, not necessarily hackers, but any thief or person smart enough to know that you don't wear gloves all day would know that your fingerprints are all over the place. If you do not wipe down surface, surfaces, your fingerprint can stay there for a very, 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 very long time. So if he can find a duplicate fingerprint of yours somewhere around your place, then they can simply make a copy of it and press it against. If you've ever seen an investigation series, you would know what I'm talking about. 
the technology is quite sensitive. Have you ever noticed that when you have sweaty palms, you can't unlock your phone? Or when it's really cold, it takes a bit longer. When it's really hot, if your phone's a little bit dirty or dusty, all of these influence the sensitivity of the mouse or the fingerprint scanner. Therefore, you need to always keep your scanners clean, the surface clean, and you also need to make sure that your finger does not have any sweat or oddities on it that would block the scan. Now, unfortunately, injuries that would leave scars can interfere with the scanning process. It wouldn't exactly be the same pattern anymore. Having a high security system may require extensive computer hardware and software. Just having a fingerprint scanner is not necessarily always enough. Sometimes you have to buy entire storage systems and entire sets of software to go with it. And that can start becoming a little more expensive. Getting to a different biometric input though, you get iris scanners and retina scanners. Many people do not realize that these are two very, very different scanners. Iris scanners use the unique color and patterns found on the ring around the pupil to identify the user, the iris. Retina scanners, on the other hand, use the unique patterns in the user's retina blood vessels to identify them. You may not be able to necessarily see all the blood vessels in your eye. This thing it can. Both cases are quite reliable as in both cases it is quite unique and quite difficult to copy or fake. Unlike a fingerprint just laying around, I highly doubt you have a spare eye just sitting on your table. There isn't any risk of getting your password unless, you know, you decide to pull a Nick Fury. Disadvantages, however, the device will no longer recognize you if you do pull a neck fury and get scar tissue on your eye. Facial recognition. Facial recognition identifies the user by their facial features. It identifies a combination of nodes on the user's face and cross checks it with saved images to find a match. Cheekbone width, eye socket height, even the length of your nose is used as data. The width of your forehead, the how wide your lips are, everything is saved as data. To compare the user or whoever is trying to access the device, it's to, used to compare their face to the data and voila. As you can see, there's a visual representation of what more or less facial recognition software does. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages, once again. Unfortunately, people with similar features to you can be mistaken for you. So for all you twins out there, but a you unfortunately have a little bit of a security risk. After enough time though, your face will have changed enough for the software to not recognize you. Let's face it, you don't look like your handsome self from seven years ago, do you? The advantages however of this is that it's quite fast. The input is, well, just that, it is fast. You don't have to sit around and wipe your face off the whole, the whole day for it to recognize you. It's just look at it, intimidate it, and it opens. If it's you. Output. Most common type of output is audio output. Well, aside from your visual output from your screens, that is. Speakers convert computer data to sound. Yes, it is as simple as that. Headsets are mini speakers strapped to your head. I promise you, it's really just that simple. Now the one thing about headsets though, is that they 
have a little bit of an advantage over speakers, and that is, you can hear, but the other can't. Multifunctional devices are, as before mentioned, some devices do more than one thing or fall under more than one category. These devices are known as multifunctional devices. Examples of these devices would be multifunctional printers, otherwise known as 4-in-1 printers. Touch screens, which we have already established, are both output and input devices. And smartphones. I mean, <laughs> really, a smartphone is just about the most multifunctional device that you can get. Storage media and devices. Optical media devices are still used. Believe it or not, yes they are. Optical media devices are still used for commercial purposes to sell music, videos, and movies. The drives required to read each are backwards compatible. Now for those of you who do not know what backwards compatible means, in this case it would mean Blu-ray can read DVD and DVD can read CD, but CD can't read DVD and DVD can't read Blu-ray. One thing that you should know, however, is both, well, all three, have a maximum storage capacity. The storage capacity of a CD only goes up to 0.9 gigabyte. The storage capacity of a DVD only goes up to 9.7 gigabyte. And the storage capacity of Blu-ray only goes up to 50 gigabyte. This is quite important as it can determine which one of these three you will be using, if at all. There is a big, big, big risk attached to optical media devices. And that is that they damage very easily. And I mean very easily. Tiny little scratch, foo, there goes five minutes of the movie. I'm sure some of you have experienced this before. Carrying on, we get memory cards. Although it's quite ideal to store photos and to transfer some files between devices like cell phones and cameras, memory cards aren't really that popular a storage medium. Why? They have a low capacity and, like CDs, they damage quite easily. Well, not as easily as a CD, but they still damage easily. Because of this, it's not too popular, but it is still used. They store data electronically. Now, getting to processing. The motherboard is both the skeleton and nervous system of any computer. Without it, none of the parts can communicate with each other. It is a large circuit board with slots to connect all the different components in the computer so that they can communicate in the first place. As you can see, it is basically the skeleton. The CPU, on the other hand, is the brain of the computer. It handles all the main processing of the computer and it sends out instructions to the rest of the components. It can have multiple cores, each functioning as their own individual processing unit. The more cores the CPU has, the more tasks that can be done at the same time. It is the brain. Memory or RAM, random access memory, is the assistant to the CPU. It carries the information being processed right now to and from the secondary storage. Unfortunately, this form of memory doesn't quite keep that data if the power were to shut down. ROM, on the other hand, read-only memory, in this specific case added, in the case of processing, read-only memory is where all the information on how to start up your computer is stored, almost like the instruction manual. For all intents and purposes, it can be seen as the DNA of your computer. As an overview for processing, if the motherboard were the classroom, the teacher would be the CPU. 
the assistant would be the RAM, the students would be the data, the seats would be the storage, and the layout would be the ROM. And that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe and enjoy your week.